horses are in my blood. I was brought up with them. Hunters, steeplechasers, Connemara ponies. There is something noble about them. The toss of the head, the sinewy body, the courage, the intelligence. My family bred, trained and raised them. We had some successes, the most notable being the winning of the Irish Grand National with a horse we bought from a farmer outside Mullingar. My father and the farmer were closing a deal on the grey mare when I suggested that we take a look at an animal down at the lower end of the field. The farmer seemed surprised at my interest, saying that he only bought the horse to please the wife who had taken a fancy to him. A thousand euros he had paid for him, even though he believed he had no potential. He had never bothered to register, train or name him officially. He was known as the Pet. When I asked how his missus would feel about selling him, he said that would be no problem, as she was dead for over two years. 400 euros we paid for the pet, 2,000 for the mare and drove them home to the wilds of Mayo. At the time I was 18 and this was the first horse I had owned, planned to train and hopefully race. I named him Rathanora, Fort of Gold, after our farm which had been in our family for four generations. We had a relationship from the start, just like the boy and war horse. Being a bit of a loner, Rathanora really was my best friend. He took to the training routine as though born to it and was making amazing success. My plan was to try him out at the next races at Omi Island, run on the beach each August. I would ride him myself. Rathanora came a good first in the third race. Such excitement to see him pulling away from the other horses. My heart was fit to burst at the sight. From humble beginnings, I was certain Rathanora would have a great future. Then came the crash. We were forced to sell all our horses and were fortunate not to lose the farm. The day Rathanora was led into his new owner's horse box, my heart was broken. It was worse than death. I knew then that I would never own another horse. The stress of it all killed my father a massive heart attack at the age of 52. After my father's death, I managed to keep the farm going, making a decent enough living. Nowadays, the nearest I get to horses is in the parade ring at race meetings. I've never backed a horse. I simply go to watch them being led around the ring, then straining in the effort to be a winner. Lately, I've given up the bigger meetings like Galway and the Curragh. Too much corporate networking, people aiming to get themselves into the newspapers, raucous helicopters, ferrying attention seekers. It's as much a fashion parade as a race meeting these days. Fake tans, champagne, impossible hats and shoes, people who have no knowledge of horses vying to get themselves photographed. No, smaller places like Ballinrobe, Roscommon or Sligo suit me better, where you run into genuine horse lovers, people who breed and race them for the love of it. I wondered would I bother going today, wind and rain all morning, but it looks a bit brighter now at the butt of the wind. It's worth the 40 mile trip. I arrive to a sunny, blustery afternoon. I prefer to go alone, but if I run into somebody, I know I'll enjoy a chat and maybe a cup of tea. I feel comfortable among country people whose feet are firmly rooted in the earth. There's the three-car trick guy who still manages to bamboozle the gullible. The chipper vans are doing a lively trade with well-set-up farmers and young couples. Families picnic along the railings nearest to the hurdy-gurdies and the stalls. I stroll around, relaxed, enjoying the raucous music. I buy a race card and there on the list is Fort of Gold running in the fourth race. Rathanora, Fort of Gold, surely a descendant of my Rathanora. The odds are poor, but I back them all the same. I make my way to the parade ring. The horses are being led out. There's a fine chestnut mare that did well last week 
and the favourite, a chestnut gelding, being ridden by a lad hoping to have his first winner. Fort of Gold is looking well, glistening, ridden by a girl. I check the race card, but don't recognise her name. The horses are finding the going tough as the ground is soft after two days of rain. The favourite is lying forth on the railing side, a place he dislikes as he hates being boxed in. Two furlongs to go, he could still win as he's a sticker. The crowds are roaring as they pass the stand for the last time. The leader stumbles at the next fence and drops back. The favourite pulls into second place. Then my binoculars frame a lone figure at the far side of the course. He's leaning on the railings. Now he's throwing a leg over. Surely he's not going to cross the course with the horses rounding the last bend before the pull up the hill. No, he seems to be kneeling. Is he searching for something? The horses thunder round the bend and the man dashes on, dashes out. Horses fall. The favourite is down, there's no sign of the man. People are running in the direction of the accident. An ambulance appears, some horses have managed to get up. A few jockeys are standing around them. Other horses are racing on, some riderless. A horse has to be put down. My binoculars frame his head. Blood glistens on the animal's temple. His eyes are still open. A terrible sadness sweeps over me. Fort of gold, part of my past. I am angry with that man who ran onto the course, never thinking he might bring others down with him. I resent his selfishness, his inability to see the potential horror of his actions. He has deprived a young jockey of the thrill of his life and caused the death of a noble animal. Then I remember him kneeling. Perhaps he had been praying before certain death under the pounding hooves. Yet, I am unable to feel any sympathy for him. After all, he could have ended his life differently. He had the choice, the horse had none. I drive home, tears in my eyes, thinking of what might have been. Mm -hmm.